Hi everyone, hope you're well, I hope you've had a great week and welcome to another episode of our Pro Chef Live and I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Shona Sutherland. Shona is one of Scotland's finest pastry chefs and owner of Tasteful. It's a bespoke business that specialises in all things chocolate and pastry. She's also a member of the Scottish Culinary Team and has won numerous awards, including winning medals at the Culinary World Cups in Luxembourg and Stuttgart. She has also won medals for both of pastry and chocolate. So it's a great opportunity, guys, to learn more about what Shona does. And she is going to do something a wee bit different this week. She's going to do a, a little masterclass. So absolutely delighted. Shona, welcome to City of Glasgow College. Thank you so much. I'm absolutely delighted that you asked me to do this and it's really good to see you all. Um, I'm really looking forward to chatting with you today. So I'm doing a PowerPoint presentation. I'm doing on uh, tempering of chocolate mainly, but we can talk all things chocolate. And then just some pictures of my competition work. And of course, the college will get to keep the slides for afterwards if you want to refer back to it as well. So. Fantastic. Thank you, Guys, there's also an opportunity as normal if you've got any um, good questions. And the questions in the last few weeks have been brilliant. Uh, thank you very much for that. So if you've got any questions, guys, feel free to pop them in the chat. And hopefully at the end, we, we get some time to, to, to dig in a little further. Um, so Shona, it's all yours. The stage is yours. Okie dokie. So because I like talking chocolate so much and just want to run through a bit about tempting. I know a lot of you will have done this already, but I'm, I'm so fascinated with the subject. I think there's always something to learn. Uh, obviously, we're doing it through PowerPoint, so <laughs> hopefully you'll get enough information from it, but there's only so much we can show this way. So, oops, I'm just going to move forward for a minute. Okay. Right. So composition of chocolate is really important, with, especially when you're making ganache and things, because if you're using white milk or dark, there are different properties. Uh, white chocolate, as you'll know, won't, doesn't have any of the dark part, which is the cocoa mass. Uh, milk chocolate has slightly less sugar because it's got cocoa mass in it, which is the dark part. And dark chocolate, again, less sugar uh, because of uh, the, well, there's no milk in there either. So it's higher cocoa mass and no milk. So Again, when you're making ganaches and things, if you're swapping from one to the other, um, you know, you need to change your recipes accordingly. Now, it's got soy lettuce in there. A lot of chocolate has soy lettuce in it, which is an allergen, so some people obviously won't be able to have it. You would find that chocolate that doesn't have soy lettuce in will be more expensive just because the process is slightly more complex. And soy lettuce just gives a nice flow to it. Uh, and makes it easier to work with for doing casting molds and things like that. So why do we temper chocolate? I'm going to just see if we can get rid of some of this comment here. Uh, right, so what is tempering a chocolate? So it brings the chocolate to stable crystalline form. So the element that's being tempered is actually the cocoa butter. Um, the other, the dark part, the cocoa mass, just comes along for the ride, really. It's not um, doing anything towards the, the tempering element. Have I lost the internet? <laughs> I'll carry on. Um, so there are six main polymorphs, of, uh, which are the crystal formation types in the, the cocoa butter. And the one that we want to be stable is the beta-5 crystal. So there are various ways that we can make that happen. This is not funny, but... Uh, so the characteristics of tempered chocolate, as you know, nice shine to it, uh, a nice snap contraction, which is obviously they're really important for when you're turning your chocolates out of their mold. Um, higher melting point, strength, and fast crystallization. Obviously, the shine uh, comes a lot from the edge, whatever mold you're using. So sometimes if you're using, I mean, I don't recommend using silicon molds, but you can definitely see the difference between using a silicon mold and using a mold which um, is polycarbonate, you get a lot shinier surface, just because all these uh, crystals are aligned better. So non-tempered chocolate, you would see it had a, like a mottled surface. So say you take your chocolate up to a very high temperature, 
you would see the cocoa butter coming out of uh, formation, and that gives it the mottled surface. So obviously it's fine to eat, but it's just not very beautiful, um, as it would be if it was tempered. Um, so it can be quite crumbly in texture, and also there would be no contraction, so you might end up with the chocolate stuck in a mould, uh, which would be highly annoying. Uh, low melting point as well, so uh, yeah, so if, like say I was using non-tempered chocolate to stick my show pieces together in a hot room, it just wouldn't work, one because it's so weak and one because um, you know it's got such a low melting point as well. And it's very slow to crystallize. So one of the tests that you would do for like seeing if the chocolate is in temper is to dip a knife into the chocolate. And if it starts to set up within sort of three to five minutes, then that is a good sign of it being tempered. Um, methods are table and slab tempering. I'm sure some of you have done most of these uh, if you've done chocolate work. Seeding, so that's adding the crystal. The slab tempering is creating a crystal. So that's to do with the movement and the lowering of temperature. The seeding adds crystal, so that can be just adding extra calyx to melted chocolate. Uh, manually, by hand stirring, by wheel machine. I've got a 15 kilo one, which I don't use an awful lot. Uh, Semi-automatic machine is my favorite go-to method. Uh, they are really handy to work with. Continuous tempering machine that creates the crystal. They're very expensive machines. Microbial your powder, which it's kind of like a seeding method, but you're not adding all the sugar and the, the cocoa mass that comes with chocolate. You're just adding the pure crystal itself, so you'd add a lot less. The microwave method, which I use on my courses, which I'm teaching online. I mean, some of the people don't have equipment, so if you've got a microwave, they can temper chocolate at home. So it's quite handy for smaller amounts. And silk as well. So this is getting more popular. If people are using various different, say, origin chocolates, rather than having a machine full of sort of five or 10 kilo of one particular chocolate, if you're using a lot of origin chocolates, you wouldn't want to do that. Um, so it, you can have several bowls of chocolate and just temper them um, more easily. So I'm going to explain that a wee bit better. Methods for tempering chocolate. We have the micro you there. So this is just a sort of visual of what I've said. Using scrapers on your granite or marble slab. And then the big machines are about seven or eight thousand pounds. I'm not sure if you're lucky enough to own one at the college or a few of them, uh, but they are very good for high production. And obviously, you need to have, you know, for a business point of view, you need to have it viable. So if you're doing big production, you're going to have to just have temper chocolate on tap, is exactly what it is. And we also have the silk method. So there are machines which are pretty expensive, the easy temper and magic temper. And they cost about sort of 900 1000 pounds, but you would keep cocoa butter in there 24 hours a day, and you'd have all only need to add one percent of that to a bowl of chocolate, and that would be it at 34 degrees. So that would be it tempered. So it is does suit a lot of people. You can do that in your sous vide, um, just have it in there for 12 hours, make sure it's sealed from the water, obviously. And that is um, sort of ready to go. Or you can let that solidify and then just create in your 1% or 2% to your chocolate. And there's my uh, semi-automatic tempering machine. It's nice and easy to clean. The bowl lifts out. And there's a real temper, which, as I say, only comes out when I'm doing big, massive quantities. Now, I've said most of this already. So I'll just see if there's any other thing I want to add. But at least you've got it for uh, future. Yeah, I think I've basically covered all that. So a lot of them, you would need to have a warming tank after you've tempered it and leave the chocolate in there to keep it warm for using. Uh, so there's various of these on the market. But obviously, if you're using a continuous temperer or a semi-automatic, uh, semi then you don't need to hold it in anything else. That's holding it for you. So here's a wee bit more about the silk tempering. Um, which I've probably said most of the things about. So the temperature of the water is around 33.5 degrees C. You need to check it just to make sure that it's not over melting because you don't want it to be like clear. You want the cocoa butter to stay really opaque. Uh, so you can check it after a while to make sure that it's okay. And then 
once you've got that solidified, that silt, you can then grate it and use that as your um, tempering technique. It's usually about one or two percent. And you would just use uh, your chocolate, any chocolate, milk white or dark at 34 degrees. And then you can use a hand blender to mix it in, which is usually the quickest way to get that blended in. Okay, so the very brief outline of your working temperatures for chocolate. Uh, white would be 28 to 30 degrees, milk 28 to 30, so the same. And dark chocolate, you can go a bit higher with dark chocolate, 32 to 34. So whatever method you're using, that is your kind of, in general, it's a go-to temperature. If you've noticed on your bag uh, cooker tour, you will have um, like a graph which shows you like what they recommend as tempering temperatures. But there's so many factors that are involved. You know, your room, up, the temperature of the room, and, you know, even humidity, although that's not specifically towards tempering, you know, it can still affect your chocolate. So there's a lot of factors that matter when you're, when you're doing tempering of chocolate. So just generally here, slab table temper, take it up to 42. So that gets rid of all the crystal formations. If you're ever having deep problems with uh, sort of getting your chocolate to temper, some of the reason might be that it's not going to high enough a temperature to get rid of all these uh, sort of wrong crystal formations. I remember a few years ago when I was, it was a really hot summer, I was working from home and it was too warm and it was just, I was only taking it to 42, the chocolate before I was tempering, but I needed to take it up to 50. I found out later that it would be better to take it 50 and then seed it back down to working temperature. So that's quite a good tip. Um, seeding there is just what I've said. And I think I've covered all the rest as well. Um, yeah, so the microwave, you just take it to working temperature and that's it. So it's quite an easy way. But again, if it wasn't happening for you, you'd need to do the full, the full process. So we better mention about latent heat. So fat bloom can be caused by latent heat. So if I'm making a product that's thicker, like a bar or something like that, um, I need to make extra effort to make sure I wick away that extra heat that is produced on crystallization. So in a big factory, you would have a cooling tunnel for chocolate, which wicks away all that extra heat. And on, um, so for me, it would just be like using a fan <laughs> to blow cool air, well not cool air, but just air circulating around that. And then I would usually put them into a normal fridge just for say 10 minutes and then I put them into my um, like chocolate fridge. I'll talk more about that in a minute. So yes, it's really the thickness of that. So if you're making thicker things, it is important to remember about this point here. Working environment, so really important. I think people are quite shocked that it is warmer than you think. I mean, my kitchen is usually freezing here. <laughs> so I really have to make a massive effort to, to warm it up, to get sort of going. You find that your chocolate shells are too thick and there's and, you know, all sorts of problems. So 18 to 20 degrees is a good working temperature for your area. Uh, cooling area. So normal fridge can be used for short spells only. Um, so that is, as you know, about sort of uh, zero to uh, one to five degrees. I'm just trying to move on. Um, and so the reason for that is, again, I'm going to get to that later, but just quickly, we don't want condensation on the chocolate. That's your, the, well, the main thing about using a normal fridge. And also if you're doing ganache and things like that, it can actually alter the ganache consistency if it just gets too cold or shot. So again, you wouldn't really want to use that for uh, once you'd fill your chocolate with the nap. So your cooling area would be, um, if you don't, well, if you do have a wine fridge, it's quite handy because they seem to sit at a, a warmer temperature than a normal fridge. Uh, so I used a wine fridge for many years and I've just, the last, last year I got my uh, chocolate fridge, which is great because it actually controls humidity as well, which is an absolute godsend. Uh, so storage as well, is 14 to 16 is good. Your chocolates might last a bit longer, the ones with fillings. I tend to do chocolates which are three to four weeks shelf life. Uh, I just think if you start messing with using condensed milk instead of cream and various other things, 
I'd say more shop bought ones are sweeter because they have got that um, extra sort of preserving power, if you know what I mean. I do use a bit of glucose and butter for mouthfeel and um, it's, it stops that water being available for microbial growth as well. So ideally, yeah, don't chill anything down too, too much is what I'm getting at there. So humidity as well, 65, I tend to get, get this kitchen at around, uh, but it could be a little bit lower. And the chocolate fridge is set at 45 to 50. So also with ganache, so it's partly, you've got tempered ganache. If you overheat a ganache, uh, then you would find that it would come out of temper as well. So a uh, smooth, a uh, temper ganache is nice and silky and smooth. I find this generally with my slab ganache, that um, it is the one that's got quite a lot of dark chocolate in it as well. That's the one that causes most trouble. I need to make sure that it is a tempered ganache and I need to make sure that it is emulsified properly as well. So a bit of temperature control is required. So there's two sort of methods you can do this. Now, obviously, if you've made ganache before, you're probably tempering your ganache anyway. So adding a hot liquid onto your solid pallets or curvature drops. Um, now, I say 85 degrees here. If I'm making a very small quantity, I would heat the liquid up to boiling point and pour it straight onto the, the pallets in a bowl. Um, the temperature drops drastically as soon as it leaves the pan for a small quantity, just because it's a sort of high surface area per volume. If I'm making a large quantity, say I was quadrupling the recipe, I would wait until this cream was down to 85 before I add it because it's not going to lose the heat so quickly. So, you know, there's a lot of factors that you need to take into consideration. Or you can have your both your chocolate and liquid at a similar temperature to combine. Also for emulsification, the mechanical um, sort of aspect is important too. So for one of mine in particular, I find that an emulsion a hand blender is a way to get that nicely uh, emulsified. And it doesn't, if I didn't do that, it would come out quite crumbly. Uh, so there's a few things you can look on there. So as a yeah, so for milk and white chocolate, I don't find that as often, but if I'm using dark chocolate with the higher cocoa solids, that is when I find the difference. Tempering cocoa butter, so hopefully, I'm not sure, hopefully you've got some hair brushes on site, have you? Um, it's great fun to be able to do this. It can drive you a little bit potty to start with, but uh, there's sort of two main ways of tempering cocoa butter with the colour. So you can use fat soluble, cocoa, uh, fat soluble either powder or liquid colour to colour your cocoa butter. And you would heat, uh, you can just bring it up to 28 to 30 degrees C to use it. Or you can, if I was doing this day in, day out all the time, I would probably go into the full process. I would heat it up to 30, up to 42 to 45, cool it down to 28 just by swirling it in the base of the bottle in some water and then hold it at 30 degrees. Um, so because I don't do this day in, day out, I just usually use quick my, heat in the microwave, I sit them in the dehydrator just to keep around, it's probably about 35 they are, and then I just swirl it until in a wee sort of bowl until it comes down to the right temperature. So the issues for non-tempered uh, cocoa butter is flaking or being really dull as well, no shine, and sometimes it won't release from the mold as well. So it is important to get that down to a T, and a lot of it just takes practice. And again, room temperature is crucial on this. If it's too cold, you'll get layers uh, of cocoa butter that are not actually sticking together. So again, that's causing flakiness. Humidity, okie oh, so yeah, so moisture is a separate issue from like uh, tempering, but can cause so many problems. Uh, on the surface, what happens is if, say I put chocolates in the fridge for a few hours and forgotten about them and I brought them out again, I would see the condensation form as the chocolate came into a warmer room. So that's why you would only use your fridge for a short length of time. Uh, so the droplets of moisture dissolve the sugar and then it recrystallizes on the surface. Now it won't do any harm, uh, like, just like fat bloom, 
but it is not so very nice, very pretty to look at. Um, if you're melting, if you're tempering your chocolate, say you were doing it over bain-marie, you need to be very careful. Uh, if you were, well, want to temper it anyway, um, that none of the water or humidity got into the chocolate. So that's why I tend to use microwave more than I do a bain-marie for melting. But everybody's got their own favourites. I mean, if you can guarantee you're not getting drops of water in there, then you're absolutely fine to, to do that. Um, and also for, yeah, so it can seize up and cause a, a sort of thick lumpy mass if it gets a drop of water into it. It's just the cocoa crystals have nowhere to go. You could, the way to save that, I mean, you wouldn't be able to use it for tempering, but you could add more like hot cream or more hot water and just make it into a sauce, or you could use it for other things as well, but it would be very hard to temper it again. Uh, chocolate tempering, uh, yeah, so chocolate, chocolate is tempered time and time again. If my room was humid, it would eventually get affected by that. So uh, you want to keep your humidity low in your workspace. And also solid to, to do with storage as well. If I've got a bag open to humidity, then it's going to get affected and then you might wonder one day why it's all clagging together, it's not melting properly. So that's that. So I'm very happy to take any questions on that. Yeah, we'll get, I'm sure we'll get a couple of questions in. That was great. Thank you very much. I, I don't know about the rest of the guys. I just feel the need to go temper some chocolate. And uh, as, as probably Kenny will testify, I'm rubbish at it. It's not, it's not <laughs> my skill set. But um, you, made it, you made it sound very easy. But um, So the... What is, uh, we'll do some student questions and I've got some questions for you as well. Um, what brand of chocolate do you like to use? Do you have a particular brand? And, and if so, why? Okay, Doc. Well, because I do a lot of the courses, I tend to use Calibo so it's easier for other people to get hold of. I mean, it's a great brand to work with. It's got consistent results and it's easily available and costs, even though I'm still shocked, it's so low with, you know, I mean, to be honest, it's such a great product. You wonder why chocolate's not so much more expensive, um, especially when you find out that one tree only makes 500 grams of cocoa per year. So it's not so little that you get from one tree a year. But anyway, I do like Barona, which I get when I treat myself. <laughs> and uh, I think the Kakobari range is really good as well. Uh, I love the, the different flavours there. So, I, um, but usually I generally stick to the Calibo and uh, and then use the other ones for treats. <laughs> and do you have to adjust your methods and technique when using different chocolate? Because I believe Valrona is quite a difficult chocolate to work with. That's so correct, actually, yeah. So um, all to do with sort of different consistencies and things as well. So it is... I, partly as well that I don't change up the recipes is that for like teaching if I suddenly sent them Valrona I would have to have tested it five times before yeah. I send them a different chocolate so you're absolutely correct there. Here's a, a great question in from Brian what has been your most elaborate or complex uh, showpiece? I think the the one that I did for the uh, World Cup in Luxembourg so the fact 2018 I think that was so uh, yes, in fact, you'll get to see, oh, we'll get to see that. I think, yeah, I think I've got yeah. it on that one. I'll find it anyway for you. Uh, so, yes, that took quite a lot of consideration and prep. And also from a packaging point of view, it seemed to take an insane length of time to actually decide how to package it and find all the appropriate boxes and stuff. So um, I'll hopefully get a picture of that to you. So was that centrepiece, um, was, was the majority of that done in Scotland and then transported to Luxembourg? That's correct. So I made it up into sort of three sections. And then because I was going across with the team anyway, um, you know, the scan boxes, it yeah. was great. I mean, I didn't have it refrigerated or anything like that. It was just ambient because the whole of the van was going to be refrigerated. So I was like, oh, no, what a nightmare. Yeah. It's like, how can I keep this at ambient? So anyway, it was stuffed in that and it was locked, you know, it was great to have that locked away in one of the big scan boxes. So I knew nobody could chuck it around or bash into it, you know, because it was a wee bit hectic <laughs> sometimes in the, the competitions. 
Um, so I kind of had to package it in three different pieces, but at least it could be kind of locked away in, in there safe. <laughs> and is that the most nervous bit, that transportation? Yeah, I think, well, funnily enough, I had, after I got it into the boxes and into the van, I mean, I was just absolutely knackered, <laughs> to be honest. It was like, you know, such a combination of effort and stuff like that to, to get to that point. And I had felt like it was a pretty stressful time, yeah. And how did you deal with the stress? Because obviously, you know, you're you're a big part of, of the Scottish team. You know, you've got you've got those whites on and you're representing your country. How does it feel um, standing, making that, building that piece for the last time to get judged? Is it-, it is pretty terrifying, actually. The, la- the one I did for Luxembourg was slightly different because I could do that separately. I was uh, kind of supporting the team and uh, uh, competing as an individual but under the umbrella of the Scottish team. But I'd say the one at the Olympics was I had to kind of, do the finishing touches during our preparations for the actual, I mean, I could do some of it, yeah, take parts of it sort of thing. But the last sort of final construction was sort of under scrutiny while there was pots and pans and everything flying around. So it was, that was, that was tough going. And I think from a point of view of controlling nerves, I mean, I think for the whole years running up to it, there are butterflies in your tummy. So, I had to find some way of dealing with it. So, I mean, I do a bit of yoga anyway, but I think that completely helped me just sort to, of with the breathing yeah. and just like kind of put the blinkers on and focus and also try and get some what do relaxation time when you kind of have, have to mentally box it off. <laughs> mm-hmm. Take a step back um, and do that. But also another thing that I do is for nerves is, I mean, you can kind of visualise which you shouldn't do all the disasters that can happen. I mean, I know you need to be aware of them, but it's very easy to go, oh, my God, you know, this is, like, so big, uh, this sort of competition. It's very easy to visualise what could go wrong. So even yeah. though you're aware of it, just, in my, like, I visualise the finished product. I visualise me completing the task, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And I think, in a way, if you've got that in your sight, then it, it kind of... Everything else seems to flow <laughs> towards that point. Well, that's my theory anyway. <laughs> and it must it must have been nice being part of a kind of collective team, particularly that you're running your own business and you know it, it, that's a difficult thing in its own sight. It must have been quite a nice experience just to to sort of spread the, the sort of the, the load, so to speak, between that between the, the, the boys and girls on the team. Absolutely. And I think from a community point of view, I mean, obviously, as you say, I'm working away, like, often on my own. And uh, so it was even, like, through Scottish chefs as well. It's given me a community, yeah. which is kind of, like, one thing that you find with lacking. I mean, working in a kitchen, the grade is great. You've always got somebody there to ask questions or yeah. give you motivation and stuff like that. But when you're working on your own, sometimes you can really, you know, sort of, you, you need that community feel. So from what point it gave me that, it also gave me the, what would you say, the experience of, well, the other members of the team. I mean, obviously, they're all pretty highly skilled. So I was kind of thinking back to the days I was making savouries and, you know, uh, main course dishes and things like that. And it was a fascinating what, you know, what these folk do. <laughs> so it was a real great learning curve, even though I might be not using these skills all the time. You know, it's fascinating, to be honest. <laughs> and you just spoke about community there. Um, Tayside as an area um, really punches well above its weight when it comes to food. I think there's a lot to do with the the people that are there. There's a real sense of community in Tayside when it comes to chefs and restaurants and producers. You you, you all seem to band together and sort of say, right, we're we're the best. What what can other areas learn from that, do you think? How did that come about? Because you've been a big part of that. I think it is to do with like communication between businesses and recommending each other, sort of like finding out who's going to be appropriate to recommend. And as well, we've got, you know, a few great hotels. I mean, because of the weddings, which obviously we're not doing just now, um, you know, I've got quite a good few hotels like the Laffey and Alpha Palace who will recommend me just from the work that I've done. Yeah. So that's that's a good point is uh, the sort of community feel that in that respect. But I mean, even in Blair Gowrie itself, there has been a lot of effort gone in by just all the shop owners. Uh, you know, they've built up, what would you say, 
more schemes and sort of websites for the for the area for yeah. all the businesses. I mean, a lot. I mean, they're all small businesses, and you know, it's really good to have some kind of you know, community effort to get to get the message out there. But I agree with you with the, the availability of food is fascinating here. So yeah, yes, it was, but it was I know, particularly. <laughs> Um, I'm going to take another couple of questions from the students and then before we move on to your, your second presentation. Um, so we've got, uh, what are the best molds to use? Is there a brand uh, and where do you get them? Okay, okay. So molds wise, always if you're doing chocolate work, uh, use like polycarbonate's the best thing to use. You can get different grades of polycarbonate, well, as in standards, I suppose. So, I mean, places like Chocolate World in Antwerp, I mean, they are second to none. The molds are brilliant quality. They will last for quite a long time. Um, if you were making, you know, I don't, I don't mind a cheap mold once in a while. <laughs> you can get them available. But if, if you're relying on it day in, day out, you know, do pay that extra money. You can also get uh, magnetic molds, which no doubt you'll have seen where you can put a transfer sheet inside the mold. They are obviously pretty expensive, but I need a wee bit more care, I'd say, because of the magnets and stuff like that. So, you know, a nice gentle washing and looking after them well. Uh, so a wide range, but yeah. And so people usually ask about silicon. Now that's fine. If you're turning out like solid little shapes and just piping chocolate into them, that's fine. You know, it depends what it's for. But obviously, I'm not going to be using that for sort of tipping out chocolate and crafting molds and things like that. So it's very much to, to do. I've, oh, I meant to mention as well with the cheap, old, <laughs> cheap ones. I mean, if you're casting like shoes and things, if you're doing hollow stuff, you know, the molds are pretty horrifically priced. So if you were doing it maybe for one season um, or like, say, Easter or something like that, you could get a sort of cheaper mold than just as long as you weren't relying on it for years to come. <laughs> so... And there's a question here from Brian, and this will be our last one until your, your next presentation. What is your favourite piece of equipment to work with? What can you not do without? Well, that's a great one. Now, I still jump up with joy when I remember getting my tempering machine. I'd uh, tempered for two years by microwave, and that just about knocked me over the edge, especially <laughs> that whole summer I was talking about. So but it was such a life-changing thing, you know, I mean, I just thought, no, I can't not have one anymore. You get to that stage where you just like can't operate your business. I mean, I've had lots of people in the business. I mean, I'm not wanting a big business. So if you have other people that's there to do the jobs that, um, you know, take a bit of time while you're doing other things, that's totally fine. But I was like, I've got to just dump the chocolate on there, let it do its thing while I'm running around doing other stuff. So I think that was a, a kind of monumental moment for me, was <laughs> getting my tempting machine. Um, I'll suggest I'll tell you another couple of good ones is my uh, heat gun. So just like a black and decker heat gun, love that. Um, cranked palette knives, which I'm sure you all love as well. I'm just trying to think. Like that's that's definitely me. Oh, the the chocolate fridge as well. My humidity control chocolate fridge that that came more recently, but that's another one that's kind of life changing. So, and I presume you use a, a laser temperature probe. Yeah, now that's a good a one good as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, they are two great, great things as well. Uh, they're pretty handy to have and I use it constantly. I've got probes and I've got um, the infrared ones as well. So that's a very good one, Guy. <laughs> right, so um, we're, we're kind of halfway through. If you want to um, move on to your second presentation and then we'll maybe take event. some questions at the end as well. So competition events. Obviously, there's a wide range of them, but we love Scott Hot, don't we, Gary? <laughs> this is a... <laughs> uh, I mean, I think it's hard. To, I mean, some areas don't do competitions at all. So, I mean, when I was down in the Lake District, a few of the hotels got together and we did uh, some competition events, which are really good sort of introduction. And, you know, they were quite at high level, uh, but obviously on a bit smaller scale. So it was really nice to be able to do them. I mean, there are specialist groups. So we've got the British Sugar Craft Guild, the Resort of Chef of the Year, Craft Guild and Chef, and all the various other ones. Uh, North East Scotland one as well. was a great one that I went to judge. So uh, lots of different avenues there. And then we've got the National to Us, so Scottish Culinary Championships and the Salon Culinary. So that is probably... A 
nearly sort of an international one, but to us it's a another national one. So, um, and then of course the international ones that are various. So the one I've been to is the Cunning World Cup, that's in Luxembourg, and the Olympics in Stuttgart. So the more specialist ones uh, worldwide for chocolate work is Coupe de Monde de and the Patissier and the World uh, Chocolate Masters as well. So there's loads more sort of around the world. But I mean, if you look at any of these online, you know, just to get some inspiration, it, I mean, it's utterly mind blowing what, what people are producing out there. A lot of them will be uh, artists. I mean, I'm not an artist in any way. So you'll find that a lot of people will be really arty people and, have, you know, sort of brought up with our, all their lives and they're just trans, they're transferring skills to chocolate and pastry work, which is amazing. I mean, it's just mind blowing. Even if I lived six lives, I'd never actually get to that level, which is slightly depressing me. Um, so why would you compete? So really bar and current skills, it really gives you that incentive to increase your skill levels and learn new skills and raise a bar on your own one. So you get to work with inspiring chefs and meet like-minded people. It was quite strange, actually, because I'd been out of, just like with family life and stuff like that, I'd been out of um, a brigade of chefs for quite a few years. And it was actually quite daunting, the thought of getting back to it. So again, that's where Scottish chefs gave me that, that bridge, that bridge that I needed to get sort of back into that style of things, which was great. I mean, it felt like coming home, in fact, so it was fantastic. So feel part of something bigger. I mean, when you meet the other teams, I mean, a lot of them are really nice and want to chat and, you know, find out about your country. You will swap your, your badges as well because you can have, you know, you wear Scottish chef's badge. You can have people swap them. Um, feel part of a team to represent your country. I mean, that's such an honour. Uh, satisfaction and achievement. I think it took me a while to wind down after uh, some of the, the team competition stuff <laughs> to actually feel the satisfaction <laughs> but uh, eventually I do feel satisfied with it now it was quite a quite a stressful time a lot lots taken uh, secondary benefit is an advert for your company if you worked for but that wasn't my sort of motivation at all for getting there it was kind of more like I couldn't help myself rather than anything to do with the, the uh, business but it is you know I, it is a good advert for business right now so examples of my competition work. So as I mentioned, Lake Districts of Cold Table Coming Art. I did the school chef of the year while my daughter was young. I was in contract catering. So that was like a hot kitchen, which was exciting. Uh, Local Authority Catering Association also through the contract catering did Cold Table Coming Art. So uh, the Craft Guild of Chefs actually judged that. Uh, Scottish Baking Awards, uh, Comedy Championships, and that's one at Scott Hawk. So I did Showpiece and Build Chocolates, Comedy World Cup, and the IKEA Olympics. So here is way back 2014 <laughs> was a cake. So I entered the cake, chocolate cake category, and I didn't know what I was going to actually serve it on. I was like, oh, I think I'll just make something out of chocolate. I'd recently been on Martin Schiffer's chocolate course. Um, so I'd actually learned a few skills. So I thought, well, I'll put them to good use and use the kind of bark effect here, making silicon molds to make berries and stuff. But this seems like a lifetime ago, actually. Um, so I just wanted to create something different. So that was a, a nice win, that one. <laughs> so Scott Hot, uh, I did this one, which, I mean, the showpiece I tried to use as many different techniques as possible. So I was using sort of a sculpting for the dolphin, adding these sort of strips of, well, strips. It's like using chocolate party. I'm sure some of you all have already done that. I wanted to, I mean, try and include shiny surfaces, matte surfaces. I've even got some bloomed chocolate here. So I used gelatine molds for the rope, made up a gelatin, nice solid gelatine mix. Well, while it was still warm, just put some normal rope in it. Obviously it's not made for eating anyway. So, um, and then cast that in chocolate. And because it bloomed, it gave a really nice effect for that rope. So I didn't have to do anything to it. In fact, I would not be able to get that effect by doing it myself. So it was great to have that sugar bloom uh, on there. Not the yeah, sugar bloom. So 
uh, different textures using kind of freestyle. Uh, so just like chucking a load of chocolate in a bowl of coconut, so you can get kind of freestyle rock-like things. You can get your marble slab by chopping up colored chocolate and casting it in a frame. And I used a gelatin mold to make my lobster. So basically, I felt a wee bar, you know, a little bit barbaric to <laughs> taking apart a kiddie's uh, lobster toy. I was cutting off legs and all sorts so that I could cast it in the in the gelatin mold and then uh, make it into chocolate. Uh, and then the uh, the sea urchins were made by filling balloons and then squashing them down a little uh, to let them set. So that was like a perfect way to make a sea urchin. So I did this working from home and it wasn't much fun space-wise, to be honest. It was a real challenge. So this is the one that I did for the Conley World Cup in Luxembourg. So as I say, I went as um, support for the team, but I was entered into this uh, part of the competition, the individual. So I got a bronze for this, which was utterly amazing. I was like so chuffed. I mean, the, you should see the stuff there. It's, you know, mind-blowing. So, I mean, uh, to get any medal, I was like, oh, over the moon. So I did, I tend to stay away from copyrighted things. So it's, well, one, it's really hard to recreate something copyrighted. Um, so I, even judges, I don't think, unless it's absolutely perfect, um, they don't tend to encourage people to do that. So I went for a kind of, um, what would you say, uh, like sorcery theme. Uh, so a lot of it took a lot of time to get all the elements together. I mean, the actual, the one that's got the wee rings in it there, the black and white rings, which is the base, uh, down at the base here. I mean, that took me a whole day. <laughs> but bearing in mind that I'm doing all the cleaning up and scraping chocolate and stuff like that. But that was like a whole day's work just to do this, this um, white and black base. So, I mean, time is your biggest asset and you've got to start planning like really early on and just you know, think of a time that you think it's going to take and sort of treble it or quadruple it <laughs> really is, um, take, it takes a lot longer than you think. So I also made some leaves, which were actually painted on real leaves. Again, it's not been eaten this, so um, you could do, use things that are not particularly food safe, and then just use the airbrush to spray them. This is the, more my own sort of made mould for the, the main, structure of it and of course you have to make sure that it's all going to stand up so I actually couldn't put it all together in my own kitchen um what I had to do was I had to make sure that it all balanced but not stick it together and then so I knew when I got to the venue I just need to take some tempered chocolate in a flask <laughs> and kind of like squirt it on and then place bits on take my free spray um, I mean, again, that wasn't under the same conditions as setting it up within the, the, the team kitchen that you work in at the venue, but it was still, you had time constraints and everybody's running about with all these fragile things. So I had uh, two of the girls with me to make sure I got it to the right spot because you can't think of everything. <laughs> it's, a bit, it's a bit of a daunt, daunting task when you, when you come into the event arena about where to go. So it's always good to have lots of pairs of eyes with you. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Okay, so I filled chocolates there. I got silver and a gold for these, which was great. So again, a lot of variety. If you're doing hand-dipped chocolates, they will actually check that they can see a fork mark on the base of their chocolate. To make, you know, if it's too neat, you've obviously gone to use an angle back. So although these uh, ones, the brown ones at the right-hand side, um, they were hand-dipped, I mean, you can add extra decoration onto them, but, uh, you know, they would still need to be shown that you hand dip them, if you know what I mean. So, uh, so I'd like to use a bit of variety. We've got the, the spray of cocoa butter on the, the lavender ones, which gives that outer texture. We've got shiny, we've got mattes, uh, we've got colours. So just like a lot of variety. These are the ones, I think a couple of these were just a wee bit too big. If you're working with, um, I mean, they didn't specify a size or a weight, but if you're doing the, the international competition, you'll find that the weight of a petty four has got to be between 14 and 16 grams. So you've got to be so conscious of every gram of, you know, if your base is a wee bit thick one time, you know, that can knock you over the weight. So 
you have to be really careful about what size is. Um, I mean, I, I know now, but I wouldn't have known then that that was slightly too, too big, if you know what I mean. So that was quite a satisfying one. Well, I got a bronze for my pictures as well. So I, all I did was, I mean, during the year, I'd taken some photos um, of some of the work that I'd done just for Facebook or something like that. And I thought, okay, I may as well blow these up and enter them in the, the foodie competition. I mean, I'm not a particular photographer, but I just thought, well, they are photos of food. I'll just put them in. So I can't say I'm disappointed having a wee bronze medal <laughs> into the bag in there. Team competition. So here we are at top right. That's when we were in uh, Stuttgart. So the kitchens were really small. Uh, I mean, they do recommend that you practice in the kitchen that's small, like that, because they hand out all the information in advance. So you know what size of kitchen you've got, you know what equipment you're going to have. And oh, it's a nightmare. Some of the equipment's so digital, it's a total nightmare to, <laughs> to work it. So there's a wee man, I was calling a wee technical man over roads to, <laughs> to help me work out how to use the oven. I mean, we do actually give you that information, but when you're up the wall, it's not much fun to try and work it out. Um, so this was a dessert at the top right that was for the uh, Cunning Olympics. And then the one that I helped support on the 2018, that was the, uh, the World Cup one. I didn't make that actually in the kitchen, but I helped with the development of it, which was really satisfying. Uh, this showpiece here was the one that was combined in Stuttgart. So that was the one which was a bit of a stress getting put together. <laughs> so I don't know. They treat it slightly differently. They don't, because they know not everybody's an artist, they actually judge that separately. There's sort of three, first, second, third, uh, which are just mind blowing uh, quality of stuff. And uh, so it doesn't. Well, it doesn't affect the marks. As long as you've got a showpiece, it doesn't affect the overall mark for the, the team, but it's such a different thing from doing hot kitchen. So that was some of the team from before. Let's see. So the various sponsors, yeah, I want to mention sponsors as well. So we've got Calibo that supplied the chocolate, Albert Bartlett, I think gave money, and also the used the potatoes, obviously. Eurotex do the uniforms. The Scottish government got involved this year, which is a great step forward. Uh, let's see. So financial support, ingredients, transport. Uh, as you'll know of Bunty up in Aberdeen, they have a couple of chefs that were on the team and they also provide the van, you know, the sort of chilled van that we take as well as quite a few ingredients as well, I think. So it's, we need sponsors <laughs> to get these teams away. It costs thousands and thousands of pounds to get the teams away. So... Um, we're obviously not a professional team, but you do get teams like, uh, I think it's Sweden, I think they've got a professional competition team. So that's all they do all the time is competition work. And we've got such a great um, backup of amazing chefs that they can, I think they're only allowed to do one or two competitions and then they bring in new people. And they've got the junior teams on the go all the time. So um, they also, as far as I can gather, they had... Uh, sponsorship from an, their airline. So they, they actually got a chartered plane with all their stuff as well. So it's very different from what we are dealing with in Scotland, to be honest. But it, I mean, it's utterly fascinating. I think it was one of the other teams had their own articulated lorry and they had their prep kitchen set up in an articulated lorry. So they didn't have to move all their stuff into, I mean, we used, uh, have I got a picture of that? Hold on, I'll just see. Yeah, we used, we were at the hotel, which is about 40 minutes away from the event arena, which is not really ideal. But um, we had used the function room as our kitchen. Uh, so, of course, we had to put like plastic down on the floor and all sorts and working on normal tape, you know, sort of like folded down tables and things like that. So, even all that, the logistics are a real challenge as well. I'll just go back a little bit. Yeah, so massive commitment, obviously a lot of work to get there. But um, I mean, I'll take time to read all through, through it all, but I mean, practice is such a big part of it. And then it's meeting up with the team. I mean, everybody's working like 14 or 16 hours a day, and it's really hard to get everybody sort of met up on a, a day that suits and things. So I, I think that's probably the most challenging bit with the team is getting everybody together and doing your run-throughs and stuff. We did have problems with that. But, um, you know, it, 
we get there in the end somehow. <laughs> See, yeah, so there's also another thing to think about. It's not just the menus, it's all your half up documents and things. So you need to have time plans and you know your temperature checks, everything that you take into the kitchen gets checked by uh, the, the judges because all that's got to be perfect. Um, you know, all your temperatures and stuff, and you get marks taken off. So that's quite a busy time as well, getting all everything into the kitchens and checked before you can even start your competition. Um, so it's all this over above what your your other work as well. This is this is my setup. Bottom left hand corner is all the things that I pre-packaged before I actually went away. Um, so all this was put in the van. Uh, so it's quite a to know that you've got everything is also very scary as well because you you don't get the chance to make something twice. <laughs> you only get the chance to make it once, which is terrifying. You know, you can't just go to your flower bin and go and get more flour. You can't just, you know, sort of conjure up some rhubarb juice that you spent ages making before you came. So there's lots of things like that um, that uh, just puts pressure on, really. And I remember my... Uh, mixer broke down during competition. Of course, I was running about trying to source that, you know, during the competition and things. So it can be fun. <laughs> Let's see. I think I've mentioned most of that anyway. We can buy ingredients when we're away. Uh, again, we want to take what we know is right because, especially with pastry, if you've got something that's not quite right, uh, then it's just going to mess the whole thing up. So. You can, you know, I, I tend to like to take everything that I know is correct, all my chocolate and stuff. Uh, let's see. So time-consuming things, opening ceremony beforehand and award ceremony at the end. Obviously, it's a great time to meet the teams. But to be honest, at the opening ceremony, you're sitting there going, oh, I need to do this, need to do that. And yeah, so it feels like quite a long time. Obviously, some teams won't be under, <laughs> be under that panic. But... 30 teams around the world, uh, run every four years, the international ones I've mentioned. Pot kitchen and play 110, prepare 110 meals in six hours and serve. So obviously this is all going to probably change because of COVID. I'm not sure how they haven't put out the sort of what to plan for Luxembourg yet. So this probably will change quite a bit. The cold table changed. Originally, it would be cold and presentation only, apart from the big petty fours. But they've changed that to a chef's table because all that food was just getting presented and chucked in the bin. So they've made a chef's table for 12 people, which is quite good because yeah, it is live. Um, there's more scrutiny in it, but you're, you can go out and present your dishes, you know, and speak about them to all the people that have booked in for your uh for your chef's table. So it's definitely a good sort of interesting way thing, uh, way to go. Let's see, there's a wee picture of the kitchen there. And I've mentioned that they're, well, they're obviously different every year, but it gives you a plan before you get there. How to get involved with competition, join the association. I mean, it gives, gives you a boost or uh, like Scottish Chefs, Mr. Supercraft Guild, other associations. Sign up for a newsletter to hear about upcoming events. Create your own, uh, well, your colleges, I mean, you you do this all the time, basically when you're doing all your exams and things or your, your cookery stuff. So, I mean, that in a way, it's its own competition. Uh, subscribe to online magazines, work hard to advance the skills, attend courses, watch live streams, even from a point of view of the sort of behind-the-scenes stuff. It's good to watch live streams to to see how people are working and what conditions are under and things like that. So, And if you're finding employment, and it is on your, oh, I've got a spelling mistake, <laughs> if it is high on your list of things that you want to do computer work, uh, competition work, is to ask if your employer, you know, would support you on it. Some people are keen to support you, others would be looking at the cost of doing that, but then... <laughs> You know, I'm trying to convince them that maybe you know may do the business quite quite a lot of food as well. So I think everybody's in a different sort of boat there. Uh, but if you're looking for a job, you know, it might be one of these things that you want to mention. Thank you so much. I don't want to blame. I don't want to blame you on too long. Keep you all. But <laughs> obviously, I can talk forever about it. <laughs> no, that that was really interesting. A little a little insight to competition that we don't normally see, which is which is fantastic. And and to know that there's um, that Scotland's out there doing it, 
but the the message coming from that is we need more money. We need more money and support. Um, I know I know that a lot of the North American teams and, and even South American teams are fully employed. So I'm going to just get a few more questions in before we let you go, if that's okay. Um, who inspired or what inspired you to become uh, to, to, to go down the route of pastry because I know that that hasn't always been you've been head chef and you worked in Spain and you know you're, you're, you've quite a, a, you know an, a good career before moving specifically into pastry Jesse well I kind of wish I'd done it earlier in a way but I think I kind of just went with the floor things <laughs> for some reason it was kind of like oh that sounds like a good job I think I'll just or somebody says oh, did you know there was this job coming up? I'm like, oh, well, I can have a go at that kind of thing. And maybe it was to sort of do with self-confidence. I tended to take things on when somebody had suggested it to me rather than kind of really follow a route. But um, after sort of like my daughter was a bit older and things like that, I thought, hey, I'm going to do what I want to do for a change, you know. And uh, so it was a bit of a turning point, really. And I thought, I mean, I love pastry so, so much. I mean, when I first sort of kind of started off, I was like, do I do sort of like home catering or do a bit of buffets and things like that. But I thought, no, I'm just going to focus on this and uh, see where it goes. So I'm glad I did. I just, you know, you need to focus your energy on something. If you spread yourself too thinly, then, you know, it's maybe, I mean, obviously you've got to do that to begin with, to find out where your, your love is, your passion, and also your strengths as well. So I would say to sort of, yeah, follow, follow your heart. Might not might take a while to get there. <laughs> so tasteful, you've tasteful. You're now in your tenth year. How's that business changed from when it started? And did you think that ten years later it would be where you are now? No, honestly, I mean, I just I think it was again. I was working at school catering when my daughter was young, as I say, and it was kind of like I thought I really need to get something more creative back into That's life. Amazing but from skill, skill catering to to Scottish Culinary Olympic team. <laughs> yeah. You should be the ambassador for skill catering. So well, you should. Uh, funnily enough, I've just actually done uh, an article for the Master Chefs of Great Britain, and it does include that. And it also, as I've been as well, it's kind of, I mean, uh, like the management team of women there are just absolutely amazing. So yeah. I kind of wanted to get that across as well. So that's a really good point, actually. Um, and it did give me so many skills, you know, like the sort of supervision skills and things like that as well, which I, I'd never dealt with so many sort of, you know. So the, the paperwork's big, isn't it? You know, the, the health the health of, you know, the the foods and, and what you can actually give a, a young person in school. And the rules and regs are so tight, aren't they? Absolutely. And the budgets are horrific. So, I mean, I, I'm... I'm still in awe uh, in, in what goes on behind the scenes for a school catering, to be honest. And it was uh, such an eye-opening journey. So I don't, yeah, it was fascinating. So I definitely got a lot from it. So I think it was about six years I did that. And then I was like, okay, do something for myself. And, you know, I was I was doing a wee job just to kind of be roof over my head, basically, and then developing all my recipes and things like that. And, I mean, I was not managing much chocolate work because, you know, you need a good sort of good few hours to get stuck into. And of course, when your family's young, you just don't get that space of time. So I was kind of dabbling a wee bit, but you know, I couldn't really sell anything. And it was after my daughter was a wee bit older, I could really get stuck into it. So from that point of view, I mean, I didn't really do chocolate. And I think one of the main turning points was starting teaching. I mean, I was utterly terrified. I had six people in a room <laughs> and I well, didn't even have my tempering machines or anything. And I was just like, oh my goodness me. But I felt so I had to do it. So it's kind of like advanced so much from there. I mean, I've done the sort of school, te college teaching and stuff like that now. So it's definitely one of the best moves ever. Terrifying, but one of the best moves. Um, also, I mean, I remember trying to box up a, uh, like a box of six chocolates at home and nearly, <laughs> nearly crying because it just took so long. All my stuff was like crammed in a cupboard and I could barely <laughs> move around the house and all the stuff. So, yeah, so I was so pleased when I got this kitchen. I mean, that would be six years ago. Uh, that was a, a, a great turning point for me because it means that I could have people on the premises. I could teach them here. I could, um, you know, I know, could also have a good, what would it a basis for getting out to places as well. It was easier to pack the car, you know, all that kind of stuff. But I, mean, I think recently the biggest move is to come online. I mean, I've never had a 
Skype conversation or a Zoom with anybody in my life until I had to get my courses online. So that was a, a big, you know, it's a lurch forward and I'll, as you will, we'll still keep using it as a great tool. So, yeah. And you just mentioned your online masterclasses. How, how, do, how can our students find out more about that? So I'm sure some of them would be interested in, in maybe joining a couple of classes. Fabulous. Well, it's all on the website, so www.tasteful.co.uk, which hopefully will be on something anyway. Um, yeah, so I've got classes. I mean, I've, I, I schedule some in, and I also do a lot of groups. I've got kind of corporate groups, or I've got um, you know family groups, or people, especially with COVID, you've got people from either end of the UK wanting to have something constructive yeah, and social so i've done a lot of private ones as well so i mean even if there's a group of a few people that want to get together and do one that is ideal for me because then i could like put that date in the diary to suit a particular group of people yeah so um yeah the schedule yeah so there's a variety there but there's a courses page which has all the different ones and i'm still trying to so I've postponed so many of the face-to-face -face ones. Uh, so hopefully we'll get to do some of them as well, <laughs> eventually. Um, this question, are you ever going to write a book? Interestingly, I've, now, because it did cross my mind, I was thinking, right, do I write a book? But because I'm so fussy on the editing, if I wrote a book and I printed it, I'd be like, damn, that's not right. That grammar's wrong. Or, you know, it would actually drive me potty. And the publishers fix all that. Yeah, so this I can is testify to that. <laughs> yeah, I know you've done really well, eh? So, so I was thinking, okay, I need something that I can edit at any time. So I've got my ebooks online as well. So if you want to have a look at my website, I've got my ebooks on there. And it means that you can download it. I've got a a main handbook, which is about 40 pages of information, which also links up to videos as well. So that's about £20, the last time I met it. And there's also like individual recipes as well, because I thought I just need something that's ticking over in the background, so sort of business-wise, something that's taken care of itself. And of course, you know, people are who buy them, you know, not that, not that nobody's allowed to ask questions, but if you've bought something and you want to ask questions, then, you know, it's, it's great. <laughs> And has that been quite successful, the little, the, the sort yeah. of I mean, it's, it has seven, Yeah, I mean, there's so much stuff online. I mean, fair enough, if I had um, a lovely <laughs> sort of income from somewhere else, I'd be delighted to put lots of stuff for free online, but I don't. So if I'm spending days setting up a recipe or editing stuff like that, I mean, I'm just like, put it on there, I can sell it at once. And if it doesn't, it's not the end of the world. So I'm not yeah. relying on it wholly. I'm, at least I know it's there. There's and something there, yeah. Like, what's your favourite caramel recipe? I'm like, go to the website. There it is. <laughs> there it is. Help yourself if you want it. No problem. You don't. <laughs> so uh, we'll get one last question. It's always the same last question we ask everybody that we get on as a guest. If you could give your younger self some advice, what would it be? <laughs> uh, get into pastry earlier. Just, well... Uh, and it's to do with believing in yourself as well, as in, like, you know you have a choice. You have a choice to do exactly what you want. And, yeah, just be, just get stuck into it and, you know, take it from there. So I think, yeah, pastry would have been better earlier, to be honest. So. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot, of, a lot of students watching this that are cheering. Yeah. So they, they have already made that choice for many of them. Shona, yeah. it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, on behalf of everyone at City of Glasgow College, I'd just like to say thanks for giving up your time today. Um, and we hope to see you for real uh, in the near future. Definitely. Well, thank you so much again for having me. It's been absolutely great. And thanks for all your thank you comments. I see you coming in as well. That's really kind of you. And yeah, I really do hope to be uh, at the college at some stage. Come and say hello to you. But no, it's been great to be on, online with you all today. It's an inspiring college as well. So I'm, you're lucky to have such inspiring lecture, lecturers um, and such you know, an active team of staff. So good stuff. <laughs> Thanks, Rilla. That's perfect. Thank you.